The Bible reading this evening is from the book of Luke. We're starting at chapter 9, verse 51, and we're going to go through to chapter 10, verse 12. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus re resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went into another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will surely return to you. Stay in the house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around, move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is God's word. Uh, well, it's great to be able to open um, God's word again with you all uh, as I do each week I encourage you uh, from young to the old have, have a Bible open in front of you so you can see the words not just hear them uh, double the opportunity of receiving a blessing from the Lord to hear it and to see it so that you can follow along we're still uh, in a break at the moment because it's school holidays uh, so last week we had Easter, uh, the next two, week, uh, two weeks we're going to keep uh, going with school holidays, so we're going to look at different passages and then we'll resume uh, with 1 Corinthians. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 uh, tonight. I got us, uh, Kathy, to read a fair bit of the context, chapter 9, and going deep into chapter 10, but really we're just going to look at uh, zero in the first uh, few verses of chapter 10. Uh, but before we do, let's come and ask the Lord again, for his special blessing upon our time. <clears throat> our Father, uh, we approach you now, and again we acknowledge that we are uh, on holy ground, and by faith we believe that we are in your very presence, and that you are very much here uh, as we gather just as you are completely and really in the presence of the angels in heaven, you are very, really and truly in our presence tonight and us in yours. And so we pray, Lord, as your word is opened, 
uh, that we would have hearts full of faith, ready to hear what you have to say for us. Lord, this is part of our worship to you as we sit at your feet and hear you speaking. Lord, there's error in this world. There's so many lies. There's so much deception. Even our hearts deceive us at times. But everything you say is true and everything you say is right. And your word always comes at the perfect time. And so we pray you would give us ears to hear. Lord, we ask for that precious ministry of the Holy Spirit, that illumination, that unveiling, that convicting, that stirring, that inspiring, that sealing, that converting, that building up power. And we pray that Christ, again, would be shown before all of us and that we would leave more deeply in love and commitment to Him. And we ask this for His sake. Amen. I want to talk about a subject or particularly a phrase that has kind of been lost uh, amongst Christianity in our generation. It's a phrase or you could call it a title and it is the title Soul Winner. Now maybe for uh, older generations you may have heard that word before. Uh, For the younger ones maybe you haven't. Uh, This phrase Soul Winner used to be used greatly in Christian circles not long ago, but it has slipped out of fashion. Uh, it doesn't really fit the language at the moment. But what is, what is a soul winner? What is a soul winner? Well, the term is pretty self-explanatory. But it is someone that the Lord uses to win souls for Christ. Someone that the Lord uses to lead people and bring people to meet with God. There is that song, the church was called to go, to deliver captives. That song doesn't say Jesus was called to go and deliver captives. It says the church was called to deliver captives. Now, when we think about this, about winning people for Christ, isn't that God's work? I mean, isn't that God's business about saving people? It absolutely is. But God uses means and He uses messengers. And He works through people and He chooses to bless their proclamation and their sharing of the Word of God. And souls are one to Christ. Now, this phrase that's gone out of Christian language today, it's very, it very much fills the Scriptures. Very much. Let me read a couple of verses to you. Look what's placed upon Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.16, it says this, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's soul winner language. James chapter 5, verse 20. Now, James is talking here about Christians who start going astray, but also about unbelievers. And he says this, Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. It's so in a language. What about the Apostle Paul? You get it over and over from him. Him who believed in salvation from God. What did he used to say? Let me just give one example. 1 Corinthians 9.22, and we'll get there in our series. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And in the context, he witnessed to a variety of different people and he used different ways to reach them and to relate to them, to give them Christ clearly so that he might win some. Soul winning, soul winning. And tonight we're going to see this precious and glorious calling. It is a glorious calling. And I want you to go out here desiring it more than anything. Desiring it more than anything. Firstly, I want us to see from the passage, soul winning is not our idea. Soul winning is not our idea. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, what's interesting is we've, you've probably read this passage many times, but 
our eyes, when we look at this verse, are tend to be drawn to the 72. That, that number stands out and we begin focusing on that and thinking, what's going on here? The 72 heading out. But look carefully how Luke sets the scene. How, how, does he, how does he set it up here? Who initiates this missionary endeavor? Is it the apostles? Is it some of the super spiritual Christians in the group? What does it say? And the Lord appointed 72 and sent them. This, this venture that's going out to win souls, this was Jesus' idea. This was Jesus' plan. This only happens, this is only born because of Jesus. He appoints it, He sets it up, and it happens because of Him. Do you see in this the heart of Jesus Christ for lost sinners? This is His idea. He's making all of this happen. He sets it up. And this resembles the beating of the Father's heart. He said, I and the Father are one. And this represents the Father's heart. You know it. For God so loved the world, He gave His Son. He loves the lost. He loves sinners. And this was the beating of the Son's heart. What did Jesus say? I came to seek and save the lost. That's what I'm about. That's why I'm here. This is my idea. This is our idea. Now we know, we know the part about the saving, right? We know that point about his statement. Jesus came to die as an atoning sacrifice for sin, to pay for sin. We know that, but do we understand the seeking part? He came to seek and save. How did Christ seek out sinners? How did he do it? Well, firstly, we know he left heaven to walk among us. He had to come where the souls were. He came to the action. How else did he seek and seek the lost? Through ministry. Through ministry. And what kind of ministry did Jesus have? What kind of ministry was it? It was a traveling ministry. It was a traveling ministry. You notice when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is always on the move. If you were, war if you were writing the record of this and you were following him around, you would be out of breath because he's always on the move. He's going from region to region, town to town. He would stay with people where he was invited for dinner. He was preaching and teaching in synagogues, in the temple. He went where the people were. He sought them. And where does Luke say that he sent them? Where did he send the 72? To every town and place where he was about to go. There were so many places that Jesus was eager to go. There were so many people. There were so many souls that he had a burden for. So many regions. So many places to get to. So little time. And he sends them ahead of him because he went after sinners. So this is how Luke wants to set this up. If we're going to say anything about soul winning, this is how Luke sets it up. This happens because of Jesus. Don't let your eyes be drawn to the 72 too quickly. This is Jesus' work here. Now it's very, it's very significant that he sends them ahead of himself to the places he will go. This teaches something. Uh, teaches us something here. Jesus wasn't all about himself doing all the significant work and then his disciples are left to do the menial tasks. That's not what he's about here. No, by sending them ahead of him, he was investing in them his authority, delegating his authority to them. They went ahead of him as his representatives, as his ambassadors, as his spokespersons. It was as though Christ was going himself when he sent them. And, and you see the authority invested in them from him. Verse 9, it says he, he told them to heal the sick and preach the gospel. That's, that's what Messiah does. That's, that's 
what Jesus came to do. And he invests that in them. Go and heal the sick. Go and preach the good news. They're representing him. And, and this is what Paul says in his letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are Christ's ambassadors. When we go, when we speak, we speak for the king. You hear the call of the king when you meet us. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says, I am an ambassador in chains. An ambassador in chains to deliver the gospel. So Christ assembles 72. 72 who will be his ambassadors and delegates his authority. Now you, think, you might be thinking, what's with the two by two though? 72 and then he sends them out two by two. There's much wisdom in Christ's plan here. Much wisdom See, by sending them out two by two, there would be a double witness. Two or three witnesses was key in the Old Testament. If you're going to make a truth claim, two or three witnesses was very important. A double witness, also two by two for accountability. Accountability, if there's false accusations against Christ's messengers, there's another witness there. There's accountability. And also, two by two, most simply, for encouragement and support. When one gets cold feet, the other one there is to help them, to encourage. It doesn't matter if they slam the door in your face. Let's keep going, brother. Let's keep going. Let us not forget the wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. For when one falls, the other one can pick them up. See, ministry, ministering to the lost, it's not a solo mission. It's not solo. Jesus himself had disciples. Paul had co-workers. Silas, Titus, Timothy, Barnabas. It's not a solo thing. And so to us, two are better than one. But we can't afford here to miss how Luke wants to bring us into this first verse. He's drawing us in, in verse 1. What do I mean by that? What's the temptation when interpreting verse 1? What's the temptation when we come across like this, this verse? We look at this missional verse, Jesus sending out these people, and we look at it and we say, that's for the apostles. That's, that, that, that's, that there is for apostles and for the higher disciples. That's not for ordinary Christians. If you read Luke carefully, he is going out of his way to say that this is absolutely for ordinary Christians. What do I mean by that? Well, look at chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. There's a bit of deja vu here. Look at chapter 9, verse 1 to 6. I want you to see this. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them authority and power to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If the people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet uh, when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. That that scenario is absolutely verbatim for what we read in chapter 10. But do you know what the difference is? Who does Jesus send in chapter 9? He sends the apostles. That, that there was for the 12. But here in chapter 10, verse 1 to 2, we have the exact same kind of mission. The same thing that needs to be done, but it's not for the apostles. It's for 72 people who had become followers of Jesus Christ. There's no formal training here. These aren't pillars of the church. These are those who'd come to believe in Jesus and now they're being thrust out. This is absolutely ordinary Christians being sent on this ministry mission. Soul winning, understand this, it is not for the elite. It is not for the elite and it's not our idea. It's Christ. That's the first point I want us to see. Secondly, I want us to see the shortage of soul winners. The shortage of soul winners. Having assembled the 72 and now putting them, giving them partners, he now gives them a briefing. This is the mission briefing. Look at the beginning of verse 2. 
He says, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This is part of the briefing. Now, he gives a metaphor here about a harvest and about laborers and about workers. So you've got this crop and you've got a bunch of workers here. Now, what's the metaphor saying? What is the harvest? What's the crop? The harvest are people. The harvest are souls. Souls out in the world. The world is a field and each person falls into one or two category, one of two categories. They are either a blade of wheat or they are an unwanted weed. The world is a field. It is a harvest of souls. And God here is collecting a crop of wheat and He is going to collect souls from every tribe, tongue and nation, from every corner of the earth and bring them in from every generation. So you've got the crop part of the metaphor. And then he says there are workers and laborers. Who are they? Friends, they are soul winners. They are soul winners. They are people who go out into the world. They bring people to meet God by sharing the gospel with them. They lead them to Christ. They lead them to Christ and they bring in the wheat. And so this is the imagery here. The world is likened to a harvest. And soul winners are likened to laborers. Jesus gave this metaphor from a different angle. In Mark chapter 4, he said the world are like fish. And what are soul winners like? Fishermen. What did he say to those disciples in the boat? As they were fishing, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That is soul winning. Catching people, catching souls, rescuing them. Jesus is saying here the harvest is ready. It is absolutely ready. And there are people out there that I have prepared to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. But you've got to go out and give them the message. And when you do, they'll believe. When you do, they will believe. I've prepared everything in advance. Everything. This is soul winning. This is soul winning. And he says the harvest is plentiful the harvest is plentiful. This is, this is wonderful. This means that there are a massive amount of conversions out there that are waiting to, be take, to take place. Just waiting. The harvest is plentiful. It's huge. It's just waiting to be reaped. It's just waiting to be reaped. But there's a problem. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The workers are few. And so the metaphor shifts from so positive to so negative very quickly. Very, very quickly. Do you see the imagery here? It, the imagery is of the farmer who rises up and as he goes out, the crop is incredible and it goes for miles and miles and miles. There's so much to be gathered in, but there's a problem. There's only a few work hands. And so there's this glorious crop out there, but because there's so few hands, much of the crop is going to perish. Much of the crop is going to perish. Jesus says to this missionary team, but Jesus' words here, when you think about it, it doesn't seem to match the situation, does it? The situation at present in the context of what we're reading the laborers are few. Why doesn't it match the context? Well, how many people is he sending out? 72 evangelists. That's no small number. 72 people going out into the harvest to preach Christ, to preach the King is here. That's a lot of laborers. Well, imagine here at CHBC, we had amongst the total number of people here, we had 72 people in this church who were absolutely committed to every single week witnessing and sharing the gospel to people. 72. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be incredible? That would be amazing. So many people going out. 72. Do you know in the Hills District alone, 
in the Hills District alone, we have a population of around 200,000 people. All of a sudden, 72 doesn't seem like very much, does it? That's just in the Hills District. Well, you, you might be saying, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's fair enough. But there's lots of churches out there. There's lots of churches in the region. Fair point. Let me ask another question. How many people in these churches who are sitting and filling up chairs, how many of them are going out where they are and where they aren't and sharing the gospel with people on a week-to-week basis? How many are there out there? How many are there in this room who are doing that? There are far more unbelievers in this world than there are believers. That's just a fact. There are far more unbelievers than believers. And another factor is too many or too few Christians are sharing the gospel. Too few. Those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. The laborers, the workers are few. He said that. So what are the 72 to do with a situation like this? So positive to so negative, what are we to do about a situation like this? What are we to do? Have more mission emphasis weeks? Ramp them up throughout the year? Are we to have more conferences that we get the church to attend to, more conferences on evangelism? Are we to do more sermons from the pulpit on evangelism? And on witnessing and on the Great Commission, is that what we should do? All of those things are very, very good. All of those things are great. But Jesus diagnoses the problem and then he points us to the storehouse. Do you see it? Here's the problem. Here's the storehouse. Look at verse 2. He told them the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. There's the storehouse. There are so many unbelievers. There are so few Christians. There are even less in the Christian realm that are actually witnessing. And the times are difficult, right? Freedom of speech is encramping upon us. And we're being choked from speaking. And our generation is increasingly wicked and perverse. And there's just such few laborers among us. What are we to do? And Jesus says, stop looking for a second. Stop looking for a second and turn your eyes upward. And he redirects our gaze. And he says, just stop and consider the Lord of the harvest. There it is. There it is. The hopeless situation is not hopeless. There is a harvest out there. It's His. There is a field out there. It's His. Everything is against us. He is the Lord over the harvest. Talk to Him about it. Talk to Him about it. Jesus says, Bible colleges equip and train men and women. Churches can ordain pastors and ministers. Anyone can sign up to ministry or evangelism or outreach. But how are soul winners called and born? The Lord of the harvest has a storehouse of grace and he will raise them up. He will raise them up. That's where they're born, from Him. They're born of God. They're born of God. And Jesus says, ask, ask the Lord of the harvest. The NIV here is not very good. Literally, the Greek says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Pray earnestly. This is for the burden of Christ in us, and it should lead us to earnest prayer. This is a call to prayer, church, a call to prayer. Lord, the need is great. The situation is dire. Now supply what is needed. Supply what is needed. This is specific prayer, church, to raise up 
more soul winners who can't sleep because there are people who are perishing and Christ is coming back. Pray and ask. Parents, parents, Pray this over your children. You hear so often parents praying for their children's grades and for their children's health. Pray that God would raise them up, that they would be soul winners for Christ. And if he sends them across the world and you never see them again, let them die for him. And win a multitude to Christ. Pray it over your children. Church, pray it for our congregation. Pray this. Ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up more workers. I'm not talking about full-time ministry. I'm talking about genuine Christianity. as a heart for the lost. Raise up Jeremiah's. Jeremiah said in chapter 20, verse 9, his word is like a fire in my heart, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I cannot hold it in. And so we had to pray, and we had to pray, and we had to pray. All can pray. All can pray. And Lord, he loves to answer prayer, doesn't he? He loves to answer prayer. So we've seen that soul winning is not our idea. We have seen, we have seen this clearly fr- from the passage here. But I want us also to see that the shortage is real, but next consider the responsibility, the responsibility and risks that soul winners embrace. The responsibility and risk that soul winners embrace. Look at the beginning of verse 3. Jesus turns and says, go, I am sending you out. Go, I am sending you out. This is a strong command. This is a commissioning. Very forceful in the original language. Go, get moving, get out and go. Off, Christ says. And this is amazing. Think about what Jesus has said. He says, pray to God that he might send out more workers. And then in the very next breath, he says, go and be the answer to your own prayer. Do you see that? Do you see that? Pray that God would raise up workers and now you go and you be what you're praying for. He commissions them here to be willing. Let me quote Oswald Smith here. It's very timely. He says this, If God is going to use us for his honor and glory, if his power is going to rest upon us, if he is going to bless our soul-winning ministry, then our lives must be absolutely at his disposal. Ready to go. He says, pray for workers and then go, go. Now imagine the 72, how they were feeling at this moment. These ordinary followers, they'd seen Jesus teach, they'd seen him work miracles, they'd seen how he does ministry. And then now they're told to go on and go and do what Jesus does, but I'm not coming with you. Imagine how they felt. Go off, everything you've seen me do, you do, but go ahead of me, I'm not coming yet. Imagine how they felt. This here, such a venture to win souls, required faith. It required faith. Jesus wasn't going to be present with them. All they had was his word. All they had was his commissioning. Go and do it. I'm sending you. Friends, is our situation any different to theirs? Think about it. Is our situation any different to what they were called to? What did Jesus say to us? Go therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the very end. Is Jesus, does Jesus go with us physically in person when we talk to someone? Is he there holding our hand and finishing off our sentences? No, he's not. 
All we have is His Word and His promise that He's going to be with us and that He's sent us. It requires a lot of faith, doesn't it? It required faith for these 72. It does require faith when you've got to speak to your school friends. It requires faith when you've got to talk to your colleagues. It requires faith and trust in what He's commissioned you to do when you've got to go and speak to those family members. It really does. It's an intimidating mission, and it requires faith. This is a responsibility of soul winning. You go. When He says go, you go. But now, Jesus highlights the risk. The risk. He lays it out. Look at verse 3. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Just when the, the, the mission seemed already overwhelming, already impossible, now he decides to shift the metaphor on them. The field was likened to a harvest, a crop. They were likened to workers and laborers. Now he says, I'm sending you out into wolves, and you are like lambs. It's vivid imagery, isn't it? Vivid imagery, sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. We've all seen the documentaries. We've all seen those nature documentaries of a little helpless animal separated from its mother and it's surrounded by lions, surrounded by tigers. And it is mauled, absolutely mauled. This is the imagery that he presents here. I want you to take a good look at Jesus in this verse. Take a very hard, careful look at Jesus in this verse. Jesus does not hide the ugly side of the calling to Christianity. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't hide the cost of being a witness for Him. He doesn't hide the things about Christianity that would make eager people consider resigning and getting cold feet and backing out. He doesn't do that. So my question is, why is the church today so ashamed to present Christianity the way Jesus did? Why is it? Come to Jesus and He will fix everything. Come to Jesus and you will have a happy life. Come to Jesus and then be part of the beautiful church family. There's truth in those statements. But it is presenting a Christianity that Christ did not present. When we do that, we are acting like the world. This is what the world does. How does the world bring in customers? What do they do? On the front page, the things you want to hear, they put in big, large writing. Everything you want to hear. And the nasty things the horrible things that if you read and found out would make you completely reconsider. Where do they put it? They put it in the footnotes. They put it in the fine print. They put it in the hidden claws. Jesus doesn't do that with Christianity. He lays it out. He lays it out. This is what it's going to be like. This is how it is. That other way is manipulative and it's wrong. It's not right. Jesus always laid it out clearly. What did he say to his disciples in John 15? Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you, and they do it because of my name. He lays it out. He lays it out. He doesn't conceal the risk. He doesn't. And so Jesus turns to these inexperienced 72 and says, I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. And again, the NIV cuts out a phrase here. Jesus' phrase begins with the word, Behold. Behold, I'm sending you out like lambs. Don't miss it. Brace yourself. That's what that word means. Brace yourself. Now, when you look at that, and you're thinking of the 72, who in their right mind would sign up to something like this? Who would sign up for such a ministry venture? Who would do it? No one, unless you knew that you were a lamb, and that even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the good shepherd is with you. Then you will go amongst the wolves. Then you will go. 
then you will walk with him. You see, lambs amongst wolves, when we share the gospel, we are sharing it with people who love their lives and we're disrupting that. When we share the gospel, we are confronting people with the reality of eternity, that there is a life, that there is death, and following that is the judgment to come. We are telling people what Hebrews 9 says, it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes the judgment. We are telling people who want to embrace every single faith, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. If you're believing something else, it's a lie. And you go out and you stand in the presence of bloodthirsty wolves. And they will have no problem tearing you apart. Even family. Even family. And some of you, I've spoken with you, some of you have gone through that because of your stand for Christ. Some of you have. Some of you know this from painful experience, but how many who sit in the church chairs I mean, we have to ask, how many who sit here know nothing by experience what it means to be a lamb amongst wolves? How many in church don't know what that's like, have never experienced? Do you go? Do you go out into the presence of the wolves being sent by Christ? I fear that for many, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Understand this, it's very easy to give money to missions and sit back and not evangelize. It's very easy to do that. But there is here, Jesus saying, there is a harvest out there. There is a harvest out there that is dying and is perishing and that's on its way to hell. Church, where are the tears? Where is the anguish? Where are the prayers of anguish to the Lord of the harvest? I mean, where is the anguish? Anguish one for Jesus. They blaspheme his name. That's your Lord. They reject him. They love sin and hate righteousness. Anguish and prayers because of Christ's name. But anguish and prayers to the Lord of the harvest over these lost souls. That is your family members. That is my family members we're talking about here. Those who are on the brink of eternity and who will spend an eternity in the lake of fire. That's what's happening. And we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Where is the burden for this? It's just a fact so much of Christianity in the West today, in the Western world, is an embarrassment and it's a disgrace. It is an embarrassment and a disgrace. It's superficial, it's showy, it's shallow, it makes a lot of noise, but it's nothing more than clanging symbols, in the words of Paul. That's all that it is, and it represents and reflects nothing of the holy holy zeal that characterized Jesus Christ and the apostles. Nothing of it. Nothing of it. You look at the state of churches, and they pour money into their cafes, and there's cafes, and there's lounges everywhere. And you walk in. The cafe is full, but the most important room, the war room, the prayer meeting, it's completely desolate. It's abandoned. It's evacuated. It's empty. Richard Wormbrandt says that the wolves are for our good. The wolves are for our good. Richard Wormbrandt was 14 years tortured in prison in a communist country. 14 years tortured for Christ. He says the wolves are good. This is what he says, quote, It must be understood that there are no nominal, half-hearted, lukewarm Christians in Russia or China. The price Christians pay is far too great. The next point to remember is that persecution has always produced a better Christian, a witnessing Christian, a soul-winning Christian. Communist persecution has backfired and produced serious, dedicated Christians such as are rarely seen in free lands like the West. These dedicated people cannot understand how anyone can be a Christian and not want to win every soul they meet. End quote. 
You see, God uses these dreadful wolves to embolden his people, to fuel them with a passion for the lost, to create in them a heart that reflects the heart of Christ for the lost. And he sets his people on fire. He sets his people on fire. There is a great responsibility here. There's a responsibility for preachers and a responsibility for lay people alike. Spurgeon said this about soul winning. One who saw more conversions than many of us will ever see through his ministering. Spurgeon wrote this, Understand then that to acquire soul winning power, you will have to go through mental torment and soul distress. You must go into the fire if you are going to pull others out of it. And you will have to dive into the floods if you are going to uh, to draw others out of the water. You cannot work a fire escape without feeling the scorch of the flame, nor can you wield the lifeboat without being covered with the waves. That's what it costs to win people to Christ. That's what it costs. You have to get out there. You have to get out there. You have to embrace the risk and you have to embrace the calling. I wanted to cover more tonight, but I want to do a sec- we'll do a second part next week and follow on because there's heaps in this passage. In verse 4, we see the soul winner's dependence and focus, the joy of soul winning we see in this passage. We see our message and our ministry for soul winners. So hopefully we'll see that next week. Let me just close though. This requires to do this. It requires a massive step of faith because we're outnumbered. We are massively outnumbered and Christ isn't physically present with us. There's great risk. But again, as James says, to snatch someone out of the fire, you're probably going to get burned. You're probably going to get burned, but that's what the task is. So we have to ask the question, as we've looked at this passage just to set it up, even for next week, we have to ask the question, how did the 72 respond? It wasn't a brilliant calling, was it? I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Did they respond? Did they resign? Did they get cold feet? Did they say, no thanks, Jesus, that's not the Christianity we're after? Look at verse 17. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They went... And they returned and they were full of joy. Why were they full of joy? Because they had success. They had success. And why shouldn't they have success? If Christ has sent us, if he's the Lord of the harvest, why should we not see conversions? Why should we not see success? And they do here. They were faithful to the call. And this story is supposed to draw every reader in. Every single, Luke wants every single reader to be brought into this and every single person is faced with a decision. Every single one. Do you remember I told you, for those of you who were here last week, Luke loves to teach in twos, to contrast. Well, what we've just read here is a sequel to something that's already happened. This is the second category of person, those who respond to the call of Christ. Who does he contrast it with? Kathy read it earlier. Have a look at chapter 9, verse 57. This is the decision we're faced with. Verse 57, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. The man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. There's your second category, those who are unwilling. They're unwilling to count the cost. Luke presents you with two options. Friends, do you want to be soul winners for Christ? Do you want to stand before Christ on that day and say, Lord, by your grace and by your working, look at these souls that I brought with me. Look at these souls that I brought within me. All praise to you, but I bring them before you. Do you want that? Or you're of the other category that Luke says, let me first do this. 
I'll do anything you want. I'll go wherever you call me to go. Everything, Jesus. But just first let me. Which shall you be? I'm going to pray now. And I'm going to ask the Lord of the harvest on behalf of all of us that he would raise up workers to share the gospel of Christ and win, catch fish, catch men and women for Christ. Please join with me in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's very precious. And it says exactly what we need. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction that you give us. Lord, we're overwhelmed at the heart of Christ, his passion, his love for sinners. The only reason we are here today is because of his great love for us and that you pursued us through Christ. And now I pray to you who save and convert, I pray that you, you, O Lord, would raise up men and women who want to labor for you, who want to make Christ known. I pray you would do that. Do that in this place. These people who are sitting here, who've come to worship, raise up men and women who win souls for Christ. I pray that you would do this, Lord, that we would consider the calling that you've placed upon each one of us to go and to go and to share the good news. I pray that we would take serious this one life that you have given us to use for your glory. I pray that each person here tonight would renounce self and obey the call of Christ, that many may be brought in so that your house, so that your banquet on that great day may be full. And we pray this humbly in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Please join me as we sing this wonderful song of the church's calling.